What is a self-concept and how do we develop one? Each of us has a self-concept. It includes all your knowledge and beliefs about yourself. It answers the question, who are you? These self-schemas can include physical descriptions of yourself, your various social roles, your personal traits, and existential statements like, I am human. It usually includes positive, negative, and what we call neutral beliefs. Neutral beliefs don't have a value attached to them. For example, I am an average height. I do not believe that to be a good thing or a bad thing. Humans are so unique that no two self-concepts are exactly alike. And sometimes our self-concept doesn't quite match up with how others see us. More on that later in the lecture and later in the course. This collection of beliefs plays an important role in how you process information. These beliefs impact what you pay attention to and how you perceive the world around you. If, for instance, you are in a noisy, crowded space and someone says your name or mentions something important to you, you are more likely to hear it and pay attention to it than something that isn't relevant to you. We call this the cocktail party effect. Your brain tends to ignore what isn't meaningful to you and pay attention to what is. So even at a party, your self-concept impacts your thoughts and actions. The examples of self-schemas on the previous slide are part of the inner self-concept that reflects how we think about ourselves. It develops in part through self-reflection. Here are some of the other ways psychologists describe the self-concept. Each of us also has an outer self-concept that is influenced by factors outside the self. If you go to college and you are surrounded by college students, chances are that college plays an important role in your self-concept. As depicted here in the image here, the inner self does not always match the outer self. Personality psychologists recognize that most people put on a type of mask in social situations, behaving in ways that are socially acceptable but not necessarily authentic. Generally speaking, the self-concept is fairly stable within a social situation. Yet, the self-concept is also malleable and can change over time and in response to life experience and the social context. How you think about yourself in the context of school doesn't change from week to week, but it might change from freshman year to senior year. After graduation, that part of your self-concept will probably change to that of a worker. How you think about yourself in terms of your relationships with family and friends is probably consistent from day to day as well. But compare your self-concept today to what it was 10 years ago, and you might note some differences or inconsistencies. All of this means the self-concept is multifaceted, there are multiple parts or dimensions or pieces to it. Some psychologists try to identify those dimensions and create tests that others can use to measure the self-concept. Our self-concept is related to two other topics, self-esteem and self-presentation. And these three concepts map onto the ABCs of psychology, effect, behavior, cognition. Effect is represented by self-esteem, how we feel about ourselves, how we evaluate ourselves, enhance our self-image, and defend against threats to our self-esteem. Behavior is represented by self-presentation, how to manage the way we present ourselves to the world, how we regulate our actions and present ourselves according to interpersonal demands. Cognition is represented by the self-concept, how we think and what we believe about ourselves, how we come to know ourselves, develop a self-concept, and maintain a stable sense of identity. Try to remember the ABCs of psychology as it will come up again and again in your psychology coursework. And it's important to think about these three factors, effect, behavior, cognition, when we study human psychology. When we want to understand why people do what they do, we should consider their thoughts and emotions as well, because the three interact and work together to create the human experience. How do we develop these beliefs about ourselves? Where do they come from? This figure is a list of five factors, among many, that influence how we develop our self-concept. Introspection, cultural orientation, self-recognition and self-perception, autobiographical memories, and social comparison. Take a moment to familiarize yourself with these factors before you learn more about each one on the next few slides. One of the first building blocks of the self-concept is self-recognition. Once we recognize ourselves, we can start associating beliefs with what we recognize. One form of self-recognition develops at about 18 to 24 months of age when human babies begin to recognize themselves in a mirror. How do we know they recognize themselves? Researchers place a dot on their forehead and sit them in front of a mirror. Toddlers will touch their forehead, a sign that they realize the dot is on their own forehead. But babies less than a year old don't make a move. Even though they felt the dot being applied, when they look in the mirror, 
they don't touch the dot. What is even more interesting is researchers have replicated these studies with animals. As shown in these photos, primates, dolphins, elephants also recognize themselves in a mirror. They either touch the dot or try to remove it from their body by rubbing up against something. Self-perception is another building block of the self-concept. This is the process of paying attention to and perceiving information about the self. One way we perceive the self is by paying attention to our own behaviors. BEM's self-perception theory says behaviors determine attitudes, which is in contrast to conventional wisdom that says attitudes determine behaviors. This theory says that in ambiguous situations where there are few internal and external cues, we examine our behaviors and then develop attitudes in line with those behaviors. I'm smiling, I must be happy. I'm sweating, I must be nervous. My heart is racing, I must be in love. Another interesting tendency is depicted by the facial feedback hypothesis, which says changes in our facial expressions can induce changes in our emotional experience. According to self-perception theory, smiling can make us think we are happy. When you are sad or stressed or in a bad mood, force yourself to smile for several seconds. You might convince your brain that you aren't as sad as you once thought. Other studies suggest that our body posture provides feedback too. An upright posture means we are ready to work. A slouched posture or crossed arms means we are tired or bored. When you are struggling to sit down and work, try sitting up straight with your shoulders back. You might convince your brain that you aren't all that bored. Our self-concept is also shaped by our motivation, and there are two types that play a role. Intrinsic motivation is a force that comes from within a person. To be intrinsically motivated means to have a drive to do something because you want to do it. Each of us has a unique set of things we are intrinsically motivated to do. I, for example, love gardening and being outside, and some of my self-concept includes those hobbies. But I am not involved in sports or gaming, and therefore, these topics are excluded from my self-concept. Extrinsic motivation, on the other hand, comes from outside the person. The factors are situated in the environment. When you are extrinsically motivated, you do something because it is a means to some end. It gets you something you want or need. For example, rewards like paychecks and extra credit points serve as external motivators or drivers. Conventional wisdom says rewards motivate, but we should take some caution. In some situations, rewards can undermine intrinsic motivation, leading us to no longer enjoy an activity once we are paid to do it. This is called the overjustification effect. Maybe you've heard people caution against turning a hobby into a business because the hobby is now seen as work instead of fun. It's no longer as intrinsically rewarding as it once was. Let me tell you about one of the studies that investigated the overjustification effect. The researchers recorded the amount of time school-aged children spent playing with some markers before abandoning them, represented by the vertical axis in this graph. The assumption here is that the children intrinsically enjoy playing with markers. There were three conditions, represented by the horizontal axis. In one group, the children were told they would receive a reward for playing with the markers, and they received that reward. In the second group, they did not expect to be rewarded for playing with the markers, but they did receive the same reward as the first group. In the third group, they did not receive any kind of reward. Again, conventional wisdom says that children who received a reward should spend more time playing with the markers. But that's not what happened. The children who did not expect to be rewarded spent more time playing with the markers compared to the children who expected a reward for their efforts. These results and the other studies that replicate these findings all represent the overjustification effect, the tendency for external motivators like rewards to undermine intrinsic motivation. Your self-concept also develops through introspection, from looking inward at your thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, feelings, moods, and so on. In the late 1800s, this process was used by the earliest psychologists to measure sensation and perception. Then, in the early 1900s, functionalism, which eventually evolved into behaviorism, took over and psychologists began to rely more on experimentation and statistical analyses. One of their criticisms of introspection was that it isn't always accurate. We didn't think too much about ourselves and draw the wrong conclusions. Sometimes, we convince ourselves that we aren't at fault or that we aren't responsible for a mistake when we probably played at least some part in it. In addition, our brains have a tendency to seek pleasure and avoid pain, including emotional pain like heartache and grief. 
Researchers have also found that we have a hard time with what is called effective forecasting, with imagining how we will react to future events. We tend to overestimate the strength and duration of future emotional reactions. This is called the impact bias or the durability bias. How do you think it will feel to graduate from SIUE? How might it feel to start a new job? Or quit your current job? Or fire a new employee? More likely than not, your actual experience of these events in the future may not be as intense or long-lasting as you think right now. Let's keep moving through the list of variables that shape the development of the self-concept. The next variable is social comparison, a process that was studied and labeled by Leon Festinger in the mid-1900s. In ambiguous situations, we have a tendency to compare ourselves to the people around us who we perceive to be similar to us. People who are the same age, same gender, same race, same ethnicity, even those who wear the same hairstyle. You may notice this when you are in public places. You likely pay more attention to the people who are like you and use them as a benchmark for evaluating yourself. I rarely compare myself to elderly gentlemen, but that's because I identify as a woman and I'm middle-aged. And these social comparisons impact how and what we think about. You may conclude that you are taller than most people like you, or that you have more gray hair than most people your age. Your self-concept is also shaped by your memories, more specifically your memories of the significant events in your life. We call these autobiographical memories. As you might expect, we tend to recall events that happened more recently as opposed to those that happened a long time ago. There are a few exceptions, including childhood firsts and flashbulb memories where lots of photos are taken, like graduations, weddings, holidays, vacations. Unfortunately, your memory of these events may be distorted in the sense that we tend to remember the positive events and forget, deny, or repress the negative ones. In one study, older adults were asked to recall their grades in secondary school. As you can see in this graph, people remembered getting AAs but forgot about getting Ds. They can also be distorted because your self-concept shapes what you pay attention to and what you remember. If an event or experience isn't relevant to your self-concept, you may not remember it years later. You probably remember your own birthday parties better than your siblings or friends. The last variable we'll consider is cultural orientation. Researchers have plenty of evidence to suggest that your self-concept is shaped by the many cultures surrounding you. One example is the dimension of individualism versus collectivism. Individualistic cultures value the self, the individual person. They encourage people to be independent and think of themselves as unique. Collectivistic cultures, on the other hand, value the group, unity, and harmony. They encourage people to cooperate with others and work towards shared goals. The United States is the most individualistic nation on the planet. Even within team sports, we encourage players to compete with their team members to be the best, to be in the spotlight, to be the captain. But it doesn't mean that every citizen is individualistic all the time. Some people are influenced by dialecticism, both cultural orientations exist within them and they adapt their orientation to fit the demands of the situation. Together, these and many other factors influence how our self-concept develops, and in some cases, the self-concept also influences these factors. Now that you are more familiar with the self-concept, you'll learn about self-esteem and how it is shaped by the social environment.